It was kind of exciting sharing testimonies because my opening statement was going to be, we made it through 2020. And, and, and so we made it through 2020. And, and, and more than usual, though, 2021, I don't know if you're a New Year's resolution kind of person or if you set goals or have certain things you try to accomplish for the next year or benchmarks or something like that. But I think the year 2021, probably more than ever, there's people, would you agree, that are hoping for a better year right? That we have some new resolutions and we have some new goals and we have some new hopes. And, and many people are still praying for breakthroughs. And, and, and many people are praying that God would just come and move and blessings and breakthrough. And, 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 and I started thinking, what if we started praying? What if we could guarantee that the prayers that we are praying would get answered? Wow. And I think there's, I started thinking about that, uh, and, and I know there's theological arguments that God answers every prayer, it's just no, or it's wait, or I'm not talking about that, but what if we started praying prayers that we knew that God would answer? I, I mentioned to you uh, a number of times back in 2020 uh, that we had to be careful not to keep waiting in life to get back to normal, right? And, and here we are almost a year later, and we're still not back to normal. And one of the things God started dealing with my heart early into COVID after I got done having my little episode with being frustrated and all those kind of things, I I really felt like God was dealing with me to quit waiting to get back to normal and find out what new thing. See, I, I used to criticize the old pastors for not getting on the new bandwagon and staying fresh and relevant. And then I woke up one day and had gray on my face. And felt myself resisting every problem, every hiccup, every innovation. And I thought, wait, this is an opportunity for those of us that say we trust God to quit asking God to get us back to normal and find out what God might be able to do through us and in us instead of worshiping normal, asking God what does He have for us as we move forward. Because maybe we shine brighter when the clouds are the darkest. Come on. Maybe we are more hope when the world is hopeless. Maybe this is our time to shine instead of just wanting to get back to comfort. Can I get an amen? on that, right? And, 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 and I, started, um, I, I started praying, God, what would you show me? And all of a sudden, um, during that whole evolution, I started realizing it was a dangerous prayer. Um, during 2020, um, I, I want to make some confessions to you. Are you ready? Don't you like when I confess my faults more than point out yours? You guys love this. <laughs> Patty has to come here to hear me confess my sins. She already knows them. She would do a better job. Come on up, honey. All right. Uh, But during 2020, I'm going to tell you something. My life got kind of boring. Can anybody relate? Uh, uh, It got more boring than I wanted it. Now, now it depends on your perspective because some are saying my life in 2020 wasn't boring at all. My business closed. uh, You know, there's all kinds of things. But my life got a little bit boring, and it really wasn't because of the shutdown. It really wasn't because of the pandemic. It it really wasn't that. Really, my life began to get a little bit stale right about in the middle of the pandemic. A little stale, in a rut, a little boring. And it would have been easy for me to point out a pandemic and blame the pandemic or to blame a person ah, or a politician. Come on, somebody. It would have been really easy for me to blame something else. But besides all of those, it really was about a mindset. Because what you think about in life is where you go about. I'm going to be louder. I'm going to be louder. I'm telling you. All right, I'm going to be louder. And, and, and what happened is I started praying, and, and, and it was easy for me to pray. I, start, I fell into this category, and I know none of you did this because you're, you're, you're spiritually on fire. But I started praying prayers without even realizing it. And just slowly and gradually, Lord, keep me healthy. Lord, keep me and my family safe. Lord, bless us in this time. Lord, help us to make all ends meet. And see, that sounds good, doesn't it? But it becomes routine. 
And if you're not real careful, especially in a time when the world was upside down, without even recognizing it, I started praying prayers that sounded like the Charlie Brown voices when the parents and the teachers talk. Lord, keep me healthy. Lord, please keep me safe. Nothing wrong with those prayers unless it's the only thing you're praying. Lord, keep me healthy. Lord, keep me safe. Lord, bless my family. Blah, 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 blah. And I'm confessing to you that my prayers became a little bit pathetic. And the reason I say that is because without even realizing it, the pandemic made me start praying things that all of us prayed. And it's okay that we prayed unless it's the only thing that we prayed because the prayers became very selfish. They became very focused on me, myself, and my family. And all of a sudden, instead of praying for a community and a world, come on somebody, I started praying for me and my own. Uh, I know you guys didn't do that, but you always come here to hear about my sin, so let me keep on going. See, I'm going to admit to you that that, that the theme, the dominant theme in my prayers became self and self-preservance and self-comfort, and help me get through it, Lord, and comfort me. And, and, and when I did that, when my prayers stopped being about the world, and the hurting, and let's just survive, I'm going to tell you how I felt. I'm not putting this on you, but this is how I felt. I felt that my prayers were becoming pathetic. And I wondered, I wondered if there was an a, a equation to my life was boring, and I wonder if my life was boring because my prayers were boring. Ah, I, I, I just wonder. Come on, don't leave me up here like all by myself like you guys didn't do anything wrong during the pandemic. I, I know the theological debate, this is impossible, but go with the illustration. I wonder if God was becoming bored with my prayers because I was praying boring and my life was boring. I know God doesn't get tired, but I could almost imagine God in heaven waiting to meet with me in the mornings and I'm asking him to bless my cornflakes. I know he doesn't get tired, but I could almost imagine, is God yawning? Lord, please bless me. God, give us traveling mercies. Lord, be with us as we sleep. Lord, bless my burger and fries. Come on now. I know none of you have done that, so let me counsel my way through this. I, for one, have decided I'm not going to fall in that rut again. I, for one, have decided that 2021, no matter what it looks like economically, no matter what it looks like politically, no matter what it looks like pandemically, no matter what it looks like anywhere else, I've decided, me and God, we're going to get dangerous. Come on, everybody. We're going to get down to some business. And I, I, I'm filled with dangerous prayers. And, and if you're going to pray dangerous prayers, you've got to be willing to do some amazing things. And I don't want to just get by. Because this could have been the end of my life. And I don't want the end of my life just to be, well, I survived. I got through it. I paid all my bills. Come on. I want to live dangerous. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying today? It's going to require, I want to do something great for God. And, and, and I, want to, I want to bless people. And I want to help people. And I want Radius Church not just to survive, but make an impact in people's lives. And that's going to take some dangerous prayers. Now I realize already this message isn't for everybody. And you're like, wow, what a great time for me to come. My life was dangerous. I'm glad yours was boring. You want to trade? Some are just asking God to get through another day. Some are just asking God, I need a miracle. Some are just wanting to keep a comfortable lifestyle, though. Some just want to ease on by. So I've decided this. I've decided that in 2021, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to comfort the afflicted and start afflicting the comfortable. I didn't get any amens on that one. (laughs) Welcome to 2021. Because, see, I think you need something across between a pastor and a drill sergeant. 
I, I think you need somewhere between a preacher and a cheerleader. I think when you need to be comforted, there needs to be somebody there to comfort you. But when you get too comfortable, you need somebody there to tell you to get up and start living dangerously. Because if God is for us, then he is more than the world is against us. Come on now. What if we started praying? What if we started praying crazy prayers like they did in the Old Testament? God, would this be the year you would tear down some walls? God, would this be the year that some red seas would open up? God, would this be the year that the mouths of hungry lions that want to devour me would be closed? God, would this be the years that the giants are slain and the mountains are moved? God, this is the year we need a move. Come on, is anybody hearing that? Doesn't that sound like something that would get the attention of God more than bless my burger and fries? Yeah, yeah, yeah. God is calling us to a life of faith. God's not calling us to a life of comfort. Where did we get the mindset that following God was about being comfortable? Instead of coming to Him for a safer, easier, stress-free lifestyle, maybe God wants to hear God, help me love others more than I love myself. God, maybe help me (laughs) to see people the way you see people. Let me see people that are in need and what I can do to be a part of the solution instead of part of the problem. God, the things I complain about, maybe those are the things I ought to be doing something about. Uh, Instead of indulging in my daily desires, maybe it's time to deny them for something eternal. I know right now, many are ready to tune me out. Some have already walked away from your computer. Sit back down. (laughs) But you can tune me out and be right here live. Because this isn't what I want. I have found that the greatest way to be, a bless, to be blessed in life is to be a blessing somewhere else. And the stories that I sit and talk about with my kids and now my granddaughter, the stories that I share over my life are always, when I look back, they're the most miraculous. They're the most God, life-giving. But they were probably the most stressful. They were probably the most tiring. They were probably the ones that required faith more than any other time. Are you glad you came tonight? If you want your life to mean something, if you're tired of praying prayers over just simplicity and Lord just be with me today, if you're tired of the rut you're in and, the, and, and, and if you're tired of stale, boring, flat, predictable Christianity, then let's get dangerous. Let's get dangerous. I said let's get dangerous. Type it in the chat. I'm ready to get dangerous. How about we really start being the church? And I'm going to tell you, I've been just as guilty. I mean, this church is a baby, and we were clicking on all cylinders, and then this crazy pandemic happened, and a lot of things that we've been doing that outline how we get from point A to point B. Some of them things have been hindered, but the church of Jesus Christ continues to move forward, and there's innovation in the house, and there's creativity in the house. The needs have not gone down. The needs have gone up, and so God is a creative God. So there's creativity in this house that if we would tap into it instead of just trying to get through another day, maybe it's time we started our own food bank. Maybe it's time we start collecting blankets and jackets. Maybe it's time, if nothing else, maybe we could just start the biggest sock collection in all of Mount Vernon. Maybe we ought to do something like midnight missions. We used to have a team that did midnight missions, and it was young people. They wanted something to do. They would get in their cars at midnight, and they would drive around town. Every group would spend only $20. They'd pull into some gas stations and pay for somebody's gas. They would, they, 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 wherever, they would just find needs and fill them. Midnight missions. You're bored and you can't sleep? Get up and start midnight missions under Radius Church. 
right? Well, let, let, let's, let's help in our own backyard, but let's help Colorado City. Let's go where a city, a whole city has been devastated by a cult, and let's continue to pour into that. We've already had families in this church that have gone down and been a part of the Dream Center at Colorado City. By the way, if you don't know what that is, in two weeks, Angel Barnett's going to be right here live on this platform, and we're going to open the doors for you to go there on trips and and we're going to invite you to be a part of the solution and being a part of something that is bigger than my bowl of cornflakes. Bigger than myself. Bigger than, oh, I just hope I survive. That doesn't, the devil is not scared one bit of a Christian just trying to survive. And you say, yeah, but I need to be ministered to. The best way to get ministry to you is to get ministry through you. Right? I like that little phrase. Jot that down for me, somebody. I kind of like that one, huh? Uh, let's keep on, Ernesto and Valerie. Let's just keep on going out on Saturdays while we're helping in other places. Let's just keep on doing those things. Let, let, let's just keep reaching our community. Let's keep giving goodie bags and let's keep giving raincoats and let's keep buying tarps and let's keep doing all of those things. In fact, hey everybody, there's a mission field that we've never considered before. It's called the digital mission field. Yeah, you know what? While we're doing live services, we need some people to get on some computers and start talking to those that are watching live. Start fielding prayer requests and praying with them, with your fingers. Our fingers have done enough work on the bad side in social media. I know your thumbs work. How about we love the unlovable? Let's forget about getting back to normal. Let, let, let's find creative ways to help. And you know what? If we start praying, God, show us what we ought to do, God will. I said God will. Because God's waiting for somebody to pray a dangerous prayer. He's waiting for somebody that will quit praying, oh, God, just help me get through. And somebody that knows enough and has enough faith and believes God is the God of the Bible that can go minister to somebody that has no idea. What if, what if that's what we started doing? God will just keep blessing if that's what we start doing. And, and here's something for you. Let's stop waiting on the pastor to have all the ideas. Because the church is, should not be limited to my limited creativity. You know why Saturday works? You know why the Saturday serve group works? Because I didn't birth it. I didn't come up with it. I don't organize it. I don't administer it. I don't send the email. Somebody, somebody else had a passion for it, and somebody else is doing it. And if you're waiting for the pastor to tell you what God's calling is on your life, you'll be waiting until he comes again. I'm not that good. I don't even know what my calling is half the time. I'm trying to figure out how to lead through a pandemic. I don't know what God's will is for your life, but I promise you he'll tell you. See, we got this wrong idea, and I've talked about this a lot, and I won't go into it, but we think, and especially if you grew up in church, you think that the pastor is the main visionary, and everyone else is here to serve the pastor's vision. That is not how we run Radius. This pastor is here to serve you. And I serve you by creating a life-giving atmosphere and building, an at and building a platform that you can use to do what God has put on your heart. That changes the whole dynamic of what church looks like. People ask me all the time, when are we going to, I don't know, when are you going to start it? Well, when are we going to, when's the dream team come? I don't know, what is God saying to you? Let me show you how easy it is. Everybody raise your right hands. Everybody raise your right hand. I now deputize all of you. <laughs> See how that works? I don't have a special power, everybody. God can use you in just as a dynamic way that somebody that's in full-time ministry. I'm the communicator. That's all I am. I'm just here to lead and create a life-giving atmosphere so that you can excel in the things that God has put on your heart. Yeah. 
Okay, that was my intro. Now you ready for the good stuff? So let's start praying some dangerous prayers. By the way, every year we start off with 21 days of prayer. And the way we've done it in the past is we've, we've had either digital prayer devotionals that we give you every single day that you can go on to social media. And one of our team members, Mark, Janessa, Jake, myself, we, we'll do a devotional and a guide into prayer. And we were going to go through the, uh, the, the, the deal of doing that again. But over the last couple of years, we've noticed that only about 10% of everybody that calls Radius their church even tap into that. So that's not the best use of our time. So I saw, thought, Lord, okay, Lord, then I'm, I'm just going to map it out. And those that want to live dangerously, you can follow the bouncing ball. So I hereby this weekend launch 21 days of prayer. I'm going to give you over the next few weeks, I'm going to give you three of the most dangerous prayers ever prayed in Scripture. And I'm going to give you seven days on each one of them. And watch and see if God doesn't do something supernatural in your life and in the life. Do you guys still believe in a supernatural God? Don't let that word freak you out. Supernatural just means superior to the natural man. We need something bigger than a personality or a politician. Hello? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, and we're going to culminate it. I know, I know, I know, I know. If this makes you uncomfortable, you don't have to come. But we're going to culminate on January 31st, which is a Sunday at 5 o'clock right here for an all-church prayer meeting again. And yes, you might have to wear a mask. But guess what? God can hear you through your mask. And we'll just, it, it'll be an open house again. You can come for five minutes. You can come for an hour. We'll have communion. We'll have prayer. We'll have prayer guides and all those kind of things. Here's dangerous prayer number one. You guys ready? Dangerous prayer number one. Search me. <sighs> Woo-wee. I'm so glad I came to church today. I hate when Pastor Ken gets two weeks out because he gets loaded up. Search me. I double dog dare you to start this year by asking God to search you. Watch what happened to David. Psalms chapter 139. Check this out. Search me, God. You changed the color of my letters. I'm always used to telling people if they're in red, okay, here they are. They're in fuchsia this year because it's a dangerous year. So let's use a dangerous color. Well, it matches the yellow. Oh, yeah, okay, yes. Your son is applauding you right now. Okay. I knew that too. I just wanted to make fun of you a little bit. Okay, so here we go. Search me, God, and know my heart. Watch the four statements. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there be any offensive way. Wait a minute, Ken. We're supposed to be done with that series. See if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me into the way of the everlasting. This is a dangerous prayer. And before you start praying it, I want you to ask yourself a question. When did we as Christians decide that following Jesus and being a Christian, the goal of being a Christian was to arrive safely in heaven? <laughs> David prayed this prayer, and, and, and David had this deep desire to please God. And, and I think it's why he never pursued Saul. I think it's why we have the book of Psalms right now. The book of Psalms is about a crushed heart when he sinned and when he committed adultery. And so many of the Psalms are about when he felt like he had messed up because David wanted to please God. And so David prayed this prayer. And so I want us to look at the four statements. You guys ready? Here we go. Number one, search my heart or know my heart. I'm going to call it search my heart because that's the way I memorized it when I read the King James, all right? Uh, now, now, you might be sitting here going, search my heart. I'm a Christian. I know my heart. I don't need to pray that one. Next. I, 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 don't, I don't need this prayer. Now, nobody live, for those of you that are watching online, nobody live feels that way. But I know there's some of you watching online, you feel like, oh, I don't need that prayer. But the Bible tells us that our heart will deceive us. 
Has anybody ever had that experience in life? Have you ever thought for sure God was speaking to you, but it was your heart deceiving you? There's no hands in the play. Put a hand on the statements there, all right? But, but, and the Bible tells us this, and it's because huh, our, our heart is obsessed with what I want. The reason we've had such a hard time in the last 10 months is because none of us get everything we want. I can't go to a restaurant. The world stinks. Yeah, but you got food. Hello? Our heart deceives us. Watch this. Jeremiah says it. Jeremiah says, the human heart is the most deceitful of all. What? Not me. I'm a Christian. I read my Bible every day, and I sing Christian songs, and I got a Christian bumper sticker on my car. My heart is not deceitful. No way. The human heart is the most deceitful. It doesn't say the devil is the most deceitful. It doesn't say your neighbor is the most deceitful. It doesn't say the governor is the most deceitful. Ah! It says my heart is the most deceitful. So while we're busy pointing at everybody else for all the problems that the world is going on, my heart is the most deceitful out of all of it. Ooh. And, and desperately wicked. <laughs> Don't you love being built up like this? Who really knows how bad it is? One thing I've noticed, is sometimes, have you ever met the Christians who watch something bad happen, watch some terrible news or see somebody do something and go, I don't know how they could do that. If sin had stayed in the oven long enough, you'd be surprised what sin would have baked up in your life. You are just fortunate that you got saved sooner and got that sin taken out of the oven before it came to fruition. Hello? Yeah? And, and, and so uh, this prayer begins the transition from asking God to do something for me to asking God to reveal something in me. Mm. Uh, because my heart's deceitful. In my heart, show me my heart, God. Why should we pray, show me my heart and know my heart? I'll tell you why. Because there's dreams in your heart. There's still potential in your heart. There's still things that God wants that you want to do, but maybe because of a hurt, maybe because of a hiccup, maybe because of a detour, you gave up on that dream. God's saying, pray for me to search your heart so I can resurrect a dream that died somewhere along the way. I can, I can resurrect a hope that died somewhere along the way. There are dreams in there. There's potential buried in your heart. There's also hurt that is buried in your heart. Come on, can we go a little deeper? There's also sin that is buried in your heart. There's also deception that is buried in your heart. There is also selfishness that is buried in your heart. And don't act like you're a Christian and don't have any selfishness because if we put all of us in the right atmosphere, some of those things would begin to blossom. Search my heart, oh God. Search my heart. Because there, there are some good things in there that haven't come out. And there's some bad things in there that need to be dug up. Because I, I am convinced of this. There are things you are doing now that are, that are a result of something that happened 20 years ago. And you've buried it in your heart. And you've used the excuse, well, that's just the way I am. Let's try to move on to something a little more positive. Number two, the second statement is, know my anxious thoughts. Know my anxious thoughts. So here's a question for you. What is it that you think of that makes you anxious? What is the thing that seems to overtake your mind the most? What is it that when you're laying in bed at night, you start sweating and your heart starts pounding? What makes you nervous? What makes you unsettled? What makes you afraid? Now, I know as a good Christian, you would answer and say, nothing, I have faith. <laughs> what fears are holding your mind hostage? What prevents you from reaching higher? What's preventing you from dreaming bigger dreams? What limited thinking and fear of it going sideways, it's keeping you from dreaming. What, what we fear 
reveals a whole lot of things about us. God showed me that what I feared the most is the areas that I trusted God the least. You guys ready to pick on me? Because I've been kind of hard on you so far. So let's pick on me. When I first got married, and in our first, I don't know, we'll just call it a couple years of marriage, if she told me she'd be home at 6 o'clock, and it was 10 after, and she got home, and my voice level would be high, where have you been? You said you'd be home at, and it came out like anger. But it was, really the, it was really the root of fear and anxiety. Because everybody that I'd loved all the way through my whole life always left. And so if she was a minute late, fear kicked in. And when all you, when, when the only tool you have in the toolbox is a hammer, you see every problem as a nail. And so I thought, I'll solve every problem, every fear, every anxiety, every hurt, every loneliness. I'll just pull out the anger hammer, and I'll fix it all. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Fear. Fear will tell you a lot about yourself. Um, Fear. I had some fears during COVID. You want me to tell you what they are? I'll tell you. It might make you feel better about some of them that you've had. When, 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 they, when, when we had to close down the church based on the governmental guidelines and we hadn't met and, and the finances went down, I'm going to tell you that I wasn't thanking Jesus. I had some fear. I had some fear because I said, Lord, we're just a baby church. We can't endure this. Lord, Lord I, 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 what are we going to do if we can't pay the bills? But you know what? It went back to an anxious thing in my heart. I grew up without nothing. I grew up having to move from place to place to place to place. I grew up not knowing what the next day would look like, all because of money. And that fear was still there. And as soon as a pandemic, I can get mad at the pandemic, but all the pandemic was doing was revealing an anxious, God revealed my anxious ways. Do I trust Him or not? Come on now. Your fear, your greatest fear might be trying to point you in the direction that your life will have the greatest impact. Let me show you an example the best I can. I was going to call somebody up here, but I, I, I won't because I don't have a mask on. Okay, but let's just imagine, let's just pretend, Mark, you're standing right here and, and we're going to label you prob- we're, we're going to label you fear. Okay, so Mark's standing right in the middle of this road. Here he is. He's taller than me. He has, has a farther reach than me. And, and, and he has more hair than me too. And so here he is. Barely. But anyway, here he is. So here's Mark. And, and, and he represents fear. And so I'm, I'm along my life's 2021. I got new goals. And uh-oh, there's something that's fearful. So typically what we do is take the road of the least resistant. So we turn. And let's just go another way. Let's get busy doing little things instead of the thing. Notice there's no fear over here. Because you're not going the way you ought to be going. Oh, oh, so I'm going to go this way. And there's no fear over here. So maybe the fear is pointing you. Because otherwise the devil wouldn't be using fear to keep you from going that way. See, right on the other side of the fear could be the greatest breakthrough you've ever had in your life. But you keep turning to the right and to the left. God, know my anxious thoughts. Show me where fear is hindering me. Show me where the anxiety and the fear that I pretend I don't have is keeping me from all that you have for me in life. Write this down or take a picture of this statement here. It says, the pathway to your greatest accomplishments might be straight through your greatest fear. I didn't want to start Radius Church. I was scared to death to start Radius Church. I ran from God trying to start Radius Church. I interviewed at churches all over the place. And the truth of the matter is, watch this, the pathway to your greatest accomplishment. What God is going to do here and is been, has been doing and is going to continue to do in this valley through Radius Church 
might be one of the greatest accomplishments in this area. But I had to walk straight into fear to do it. Now, I can talk about it now like I'm raw. But that ain't how I looked when I was facing it. Right? See, faith does not mean that you don't have fear. I am so sick and tired of hearing all the faith over fear. That's great. You should have faith over fear. But it's faith over fear, not faith over nothing. See, the difference is, the difference is, is fear might still be in your car. Just don't let fear drive the car. Fear, every once in a while, I look in my rear view mirror and, oh, there's fear sitting in the back seat. Reminding me why I'm living bigger than my talent level, bigger than my education level. Come on. Fear is still there telling me, "Uh uh-oh, you're not going to make it another year. Come on. Does anybody relate to this? Yeah, and that's okay, fear. You can stay there. You, it's all right. Just sit yourself in the back seat because faith is in control of this vehicle. Right? I don't know I need faith. <clears throat> I don't even know I need faith until there's some fear. Okay. Um, so uh, let me clear that up. Faith doesn't mean I don't have fear. Faith means I do it anyway. Fear fear might reveal where you need to grow the most in your faith. I needed to grow in the area of, does God supply all my needs or not? Am I building the church or is He? Can we go on? Let's go to number three. Number three, here's the third statement. Know my offensive ways. Aren't you glad now we're going to deal with all the sinners? Don't you love this? We just finished a series on not being offended, Ken. Why are you bringing it back up? Because what we didn't talk about is when you are the one that's doing the offending. We talked about how to keep others from offending us. (laughs) Yeah, but there's another side of the same coin. What if you're the problem? What if you're the offensive one? (laughs) I don't perish the thought. David was asking, show me the things that I'm doing, God, that hurts your heart. Show me the things that I'm doing that are offending other people. You know, mm, I shouldn't do it. Anybody watch the news this week? There's some people doing some crazy stuff under the flag of Christianity. Here's one thing I know. They didn't pray a dangerous prayer. If they would have stopped and prayed, Father, show me the offensive ways in me, I promise you there would be some things that didn't happen under the umbrella of Christianity. Can I get an amen on that one, everybody? Mm -hmm. You can be offensive throwing around Scripture. You can be offensive quoting Scripture, telling people Jesus loves them. But you can do it in an offensive way. How many know what I'm talking about, right? Um, uh, Let's see, where do I want to go from here after I said all that? Um, Let's make this commitment. In fact, put this on there. I want everybody to see this. Don't be good at accusing others and excusing yourself. I know none of you are like that, but I've had that problem from time to time. See, when I'm driving slow on Highway 5, I'm enjoying the Sabbath and enjoying the sights of God. When other people are driving slow on Highway 5, they're morons. Right? Come on. See, thank you for helping me. You know what I'm saying? And so we're good at accusing others and excusing me. I want everybody to excuse when I do something wrong. But the moment you do, I couldn't believe they did that. Right? Okay. Um, Here's some things to consider. If you really want to know if if you have some offensive ways in you, let me give you these three side notes really quick. Okay? Here's the the side one. I don't know how. I got one minute left, but we're going to go over. Okay. It's a new year. Why change things? Okay, here we go. (laughs) What have others repeatedly told me? Here's something I've learned that I don't like, and you're not going to like it either. If more than one person has told me the same thing, then maybe it's offensive. 
where two or three are gathered. Okay, all right. Yeah. Huh? You ever seen that person get on American Idol and say, I'm going to be the next American Idol, and they can't carry a tune in a bucket, and they're embarrassing their family? Here's what I know. They didn't listen to nobody. They didn't have anybody tell them something. Grandma told them they could sound, sing good, and Grandma lied because she can't hear, right? <laughs> but if you would do life with somebody, you might save yourself some offensive ways. Pants on the ground. You know what I'm saying? Okay, so if, for those of you that remember that song. Proverbs. Thank you, Mark. You remember that song? Yeah, come on now. Pro- some of you guys are just into your Bible too much. you got to watch some of those shows out there. Proverbs chapter number 12, verse number 15. The way of the fool seems right to them, that the wise listen to advice. I need some advice. That's why it's great to do life together. That's why it's great to do life together. Because I don't like to listen to somebody I don't know. But if I'm sitting in a circle with guys on a regular basis, and they're starting to say, ooh, I have some offensive ways in me, all right? Um, okay, let's, let, uh, uh, I used to rationalize my, my rudeness, and, and I, I would rationalize my rudeness and my shortness because I was a get-it-done kind of a person, and I'd get things done, but I was rude, and I'd get things done. It's like, you know, don't tell me about the birthing pains, just show me the baby, you know? But it's like, come on, right? And so I'd rationalize why I was that way. Are you rationalizing? Okay. What 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 else do I got? Uh, Do I have another one under this? Uh, What what am I defensive about? Okay. Uh, Yeah. So what am I defensive about? Uh, um, Boy, let's see. Let me give you this. I want to hurry up. Here's just some things. You might want to get your phones and take a picture of this because I'm going to do them fast. Here's how to know if you're being defensive. Or here's how to overcome it. Be secure in who you are. Get to the place where you have nothing left to hide and nothing left to prove. After people have lied about you so much, I don't have anything else to prove. Right? What else? Uh, Stop retaliating and genuinely listen. Say, I, oh, this is good. Say I instead of you. So in other words, when you're defensive, well, you always make me, and you never get home on time, and you always, no, 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 no. That's defensive. I feel I'm insufficient. I need to grow. I own these things. What else we got? Uh, know that it's okay to be wrong. Everybody else knows you're wrong. Your kids know you're wrong. Everybody in your life group knows you're wrong. Everybody knows you're wrong. What are you marrying him for? Mama told you not to marry him. Pastor told you not to marry him. Best friend told you not to marry him. You're wrong. Okay? No, it's okay to be wrong. Letter E, remember you will never improve without some correction in your life. Do you really want to get better? Then have some people speaking into your life so you can figure out the offensive ways. Okay, um, uh, do I, did I have any others? Uh, I, I feel like I missed one. Lead me into, uh, uh, can we, I, I'm, I know I'm going to mess you up. Know my offensive ways. Can you go back to that? Uh, am I messing you up too bad? Because I thought I had three of those. Did I do three of them or did I only do two? Uh, know my offensive ways. Follow with me now. Go to the next one. Know my offensive ways. Don't be, good, uh, uh, don't be good at accusing others and excusing me. No, Okay, never mind. Let's go on. Uh, number four, let me give you the last point of that prayer in Psalms chapter 139. Lead me in the way of everlasting. This is a dangerous prayer. So you got all four? Here they are. Lead me in the way of everlasting. That is a really dangerous prayer. Um. Each phrase of this prayer is really important, but it's incomplete without this one. You can search my heart, God, and you can find out if there's any fear in me, God. And you, you, you can find out if there's any anxious or, or, or offensive ways in me. But if it doesn't ultimately lead me into the way of everlasting, it doesn't matter. Did you hear that? It doesn't matter if God reveals something to me if it doesn't lead me into an eternal relationship with Him. Lead me in the way 
of everlasting. And let me paraphrase this and put it in perspective. Lead me into your will. Guide me into your purpose. Show me your potential that you have for me in my life. What would you have me to do, God, that has eternal everlasting value. God, thank you for my job. It pays the bill and it puts food on the table. But what would you have me to do that has eternal and everlasting value? Wow. That's a dangerous prayer. I'll close with this. I I started praying in 2011. Uh, I started praying without calling it a dangerous prayer. I started praying this prayer. Search me and lead me. And you would think by now I would know God's will for my life, but it's still something I still pray. God, show me your will for my life. God, show me your will for the church. God, help me. Show me your will. Guide me into the everlasting. Um, And and when I started praying this prayer in 2011, God started showing me that I was doing a lot of right things for wrong reasons. Many of you have heard me talk about one of my past ministry experiences, uh, 136 ministries, giant campus, 13 buildings, 250,000 square feet of facilities, all of that. And when I started saying, search me, God, all that looked good on the outside, but I began to realize I was doing all of the right things because I desperately needed somebody to think I was good, because I desperately wanted to be approved of, because I desperately wanted God to love me. So I was doing a lot of right things for wrong reasons. And you won't find some of those things out until you start saying, Lord, search me. Find out what's going on in my heart. Father, show me the anxious ways. What what could I be doing that has eternal value, but fear is keeping me from it? The fear of a pandemic. The fear of loving again and being abandoned again, the fear of trying again, the fear of whatever it could, might be. In 2014, Lord, show me your will. God, guide me into the everlasting. As I've already stated, God will answer that prayer. I remember interviewing at a church in Oklahoma, and I thought for sure, man, that's where I'd like to go. Janessa and I drove by there on our way to California. I looked at the church, big old building, completely paid for, offered me a great salary. You know, when you're almost 50, how many know a salary is a pretty good thing, right? And, 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 but if you start praying, lead me into the way of everlasting, God has a way of closing doors and opening doors. Lead me into the way of the everlasting. There was a season there we thought we were going to take a church in California. I was on the phone interviewing. It was great. We did the, we did the video Zoom before the pandemic and had a great interview. And as I was in the interview, I knew. I just knew. Everything was clicking. It would have been great. It was a multi-ethnic church. I would have, it would have just been right up my alley. But I just knew. Because when you start praying, lead me in the way of everlasting, you'll know. You'll know. Come on, if God can speak to frogs, God can speak to you. And I'm not even trying to be funny. Frogs, Exodus, you go on these houses and don't go on those houses. He can lead you. And I was too embarrassed. And I was too fearful. I had anxious ways in me. So I wasn't coming back to Mount Mount Vernon. People will talk about me. People have criticized me. People have lied about me. I'm not coming back there. But God kept leading me a little closer. Didn't stop in Oklahoma. Didn't stop in California. We almost made it to Vancouver. Vancouver, oh, this is going to be it. And the night we were going to have our suitcases packed, God was still answering the prayer, lead me in the way of everlasting. So then I thought, you know, I'll almost obey God. So I went to Stanwood. It was close enough. We were over there for a year, this seriously. We were there for about a year, and all the while. I said, God, if you want me in Mount Vernon, there's one obstacle you've got to remove. The very next day, that obstacle was removed. Tommy Barnett came into town, and I said, Pastor Tommy, I'm embarrassed to go back there because just four years ago, I left. Pastor Tommy you know, and I told him my sob story. Because, you know, the sadder you make it, the more you have permission not to do what God has called you to do. 
He looked across the table. We were eating over in one of the Mexican restaurants. He looked across the table at me and said, you know, Ken, <laughs> he said, you remind me a little bit of my dad. See, my dad was pastoring a great little church in a little town, just a small little town, not a metropolitan town, in a little town in Texas. His dad was known for starting the Saturday Sunday school and the bus ministries as we got to know them in America. He said he got in a disagreement with the board, and they fought and argued, and he said, fine. He said, we'll take a vote, and if I don't get 100%, I'm leaving. And he didn't get a 100% vote. I don't even think Jesus got a 100% vote. How many know what I'm saying, right? And he left. And about three years later, that board went and found him preaching an old-fashioned revival, and they begged him to come back. Pastor Tommy's dad agreed to go back. And he heard God say to him that night, the verse in Haggai, chapter number 2, verse number 9, he said that your latter days will be more productive than your former days. And he looked across the table and said, Ken, you ought to go start that church in Mount Vernon. You ought to just get over there because I believe that same anointing is on your life. You see, when you start praying, God, lead me into the everlasting God will lead you into the everlasting. Amen, everybody. Will you receive that tonight? I'm going to end right there. I'm going to stop right there.